good uh, morning, almost afternoon. Uh, my name is Howard Hunter, and I have the privilege of representing Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and the people who staff it and who make it. Uh, we're here today to defend this case. And we appreciate the time and energy that you have put into this effort thus far. You're the most important people here. And we appreciate your attention. And we appreciate your commitment both to the trial process and to the process of waiting until you've heard all the evidence before you make a decision or begin to formulate a decision. Uh, with me today, first of all, let me in introduce my team. With me today are my co-counsels, Pat Crowells, Ethan Shapiro, David Hughes. We also have today a representative from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, Dr. Dr. Anthony Napolitano, see it over, over there. Dr. Napolitano may, or may not, wind up seeing you as a witness as well. You'll see doctors rotating as corporate representatives during the trial. Uh, they've asked to do that for the purpose of being part of the effort to defend the hospital in this matter. Uh, the hospital, after all, is not just a big pile of bricks and mortar. It's the doctors and nurses and people and professionals who run it. And so we're here representing them although I'll be referring to the institution generally for brevity's sake as either ACH or, jo or All Children's Hospital. I mean, you may hear Johns Hopkins occasionally, but I've been representing them for a long time, long before they were Johns Hopkins. Uh, this is a case that has a number of different facets to it, and the circumstances and facts that I'm about to discuss with you constitute our view of the evidence. You've just heard Mr. Anderson tell you their view. I'm about to tell you ours. The judge has told you, and it's absolutely correct, that what you hear from me is not evidence. It's my view of what the evidence will show. This case involves a number of different facts that occurred over about 18 to 24 months. I can't cover all the details in 90 minutes, and if I did, both you and I would have our heads swimming from the effort. So I'm going to go over some high points. I'm going to, to, to discuss some matters that Mr. Anderson touched upon, and I'm going to ask your indulgence as we fill in the blanks over the next several weeks. Um, this sequence of events began on October 7, 2017. That's where the plaintiff's case against Johns Hopkins began. Before that, you're going to hear a good bit of evidence about what went before. You're going to hear about the development of, of Maya Kowalski's disease process. You're going to hear about where else she sought care. You're going to hear a lot about the details of that care and a lot about the problems with it. I'm going to cover some of those in just a moment. But the point is, for now, that as of October 7th of 2016, Kowalski's had been to Johns Hopkins several times. They had entrusted Maya Kowalski's care to us on several different occasions. And in doing so, they had come up from their home in Venice, past Sarasota Memorial, a number of other hospitals, and sought out care from all children. Presumably, we vindicated their trust in doing that, and they came back to see us on, August, on October 7th. We had no reason to wish this family harm, and we still don't. Indeed, there's a tragic outcome in this case, in terms of Mrs. Kowalski's suicide, and we regret very much that that happened. The issue here, however, is, is who's responsible for it. And we're going to go over the facts of that and what the facts don't show 
in terms of any connection between what was done by all children and that tragic result. Now, as of October 7th, we had the Kowalskis seeking out care at all children's, as I've said. We believe the evidence is going to show you that care was reasonable and necessary and appropriate. And indeed, we're going to suggest to you the evidence I'm about to discuss with you will show that what went before, the treatment that went before, did not necessarily fall into that category. Any of those three categories. And that is the reason, one of the big reasons, that we're here today. Now, as of this date, as of the time that my, Maya Kowalski was discharged from all children's, we believe that in fact she had been set on a path of therapy that has enabled her to resume function, to get out of a wheelchair, to be relatively pain free, and to be in a situation of participating in her school and in society as she does today. So how did we get there? Well, on October 7th, Maya Kowalski was brought to the emergency room at All Children's. As you've heard, she had bad stomach pain. She was screaming, crying, thrashing around, cursing at staff, very upset, and presenting a very challenging situation for the staff. She had pain in all her extremities. She had her whole body being said to be hypersensitive to any kind of touch. She was unable to walk. She was had legs atrophied from disuse, from being in a wheelchair for months at that point, or maybe over a year. She had dystonia, alleged dystonia, different position of her feet, as you've heard, and she was demanding pain medication, pain medication in large quantities. Mrs. Kowalski arrived a, a while later, and you're going to hear that when she arrived, she forbade the doctors and the nurses to touch Maya. The doctors and the nurses wanted to assess her, to examine her, to put on a blood pressure cuff, to put on an O2 SAP monitor, to take a temperature, and they wanted to find out why there was all this horrible stomach pain. Was it appendicitis? Was it a, was it a torsion of, of, the, of the intestines? Was there something badly wrong that an ultrasound or, or a, a flat plate of the abdomen or a CT scan could detect? Those questions were being asked. Mrs. Kowalski insisted that before there be any workup of the child, she wanted ketamine. Now, not just any amount of ketamine. You're going to hear a lot about ketamine in this trial. Ketamine is indeed an old drug, and it's a drug that is approved by the FDA for use as an anesthetic. It is not approved for use in children, nor is it approved for use in high doses as treatment for CRPS or chronic pain. That's one of the issues here. It's not just ketamine itself but how it was used and the quantity in which it was used. Because ketamine is an anesthetic, it is an hallucinogen, it can create dependency, it can cause depression of vital signs. If not properly monitored, it can cause serious injury, life endangering consequences. Mrs. Kowalski on this day was challenging the staff to give her daughter a dose of 1,500 milligrams of ketamine. That is a big dose. That dose you're going to hear is several times, many times, the maximum dose that policies at all children's approve. You're going to hear experts tell you that as many times any kind of safe dose. And you're going to hear 
The ER doctor who was on duty that day, Dr. Layla ba Behar Posey, who you're here for by deposition because unfortunately she's no longer with us, and I mean that in this life. She'll appear by deposition, and in, in her deposition you will hear her tell you what she did and why she did it. <clears throat> and you'll hear her tell you most pertinently that even if she was so inclined to give that much ketamine, in the emergency room where she didn't have sufficient monitoring uh, availability, she didn't have the, the capacity for long-term wake up and intubation she, for, for that t period of time. She didn't have the facility she needed to do that. Even if she was inclined to give it, which she wasn't, she couldn't safely do it in that setting. Now you're gonna see that Dr. Behar Posey is not just a newbie out of medical school. You'll hear in her deposition what her qualifications are. You'll hear that she's board certified in pediatrics as well as emergency medicine. She's confronted a lot of patients, difficult patients, patients in extreme pain. And you're going to hear that this patient, as far as she was concerned, had some degree of uniqueness in that she'd never seen anything quite like this. And she'd never heard of these doses of ketamine. What she found out, ultimately, and what, it, what developed over the next few days, and the, actually the next few weeks, is that Maya Kowalski had been given thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of milligrams of ketamine over the preceding nine months. Her doctor, Dr. Hannah, had given her the day before admission 1,250 milligrams of ketamine. And at that time, he's going to testify to you that he told the mother he was no longer comfortable giving that much ketamine, that it was too much for him to give in his outpatient clinic. And he actually sent her to all children's. You're going to hear that over the nine months preceding this, that he had given her a gradually increasing doses of ketamine, 12, 15, over 20 milligrams per kilogram per hour, which is dozens of times the safe and effective dose that was approved by the hospital and that is talked about by the FDA, and that it's never been written up in the literature. You'll hear Dr. Hanna say either by deposition or by admission on that witness stand that this was at or near the highest per capita dosage he had ever given any patient. It wasn't working. So what had happened was that he had maxed out with this ketamine dosage. He had sent her to all children's and Mrs. Kowalski, despite what he had told her, despite what had happened over the last nine months, was demanding even more. Dr. Posey heard this story from the mother. She heard how much ketamine that the mother said Dr. Hanna was given, giving. She heard what the mother was demanding. She saw what, what was going on with this child. She'll tell you what her suspicions were about the child's condition and what was actually causing it. But she called Dr. Hanna's office herself. Now, she learned that he gave 1,250 milligrams. She learned what else had happened the day before. And so she decided that she would attempt to stabilize the child she literally she'll tell you about literally negotiating with the mother to give a small dose of ketamine and some sedative to conduct an examination to admit the child to the pediatric intensive care unit, the, well, you'll hear it called the PICU, and to, the idea that she had at that time was let's get her in the PICU, let's get her evaluated by pain management, Let's see what's really going on here. Let's get her stabilized and then 
let's see if we can wean her down off all this medication she's been given. So she admitted her to the PICU. And she went, uh, and Maya Kowalski was taken up to the PICU floor. And that process, in fact, began after consultations were placed by the PICU staff to have, to have her see anesthesiology, pain management, and psychiatry, as well as to do some more diagnostic studies and blood workup. So what was being done here at this point? What was reasonably prudent with what these physicians knew and what they knew it? What was happening was that they had a child being given levels of medication that they had never heard of before, that the literature did not support, that the literature didn't even mention. And so they put her in a safe environment, they attempted to get her stabilized, they called the correct consultations, and they tried to investigate what was going on. We will suggest to you, the evidence will suggest, and the experts will say, that that was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. There's no conspiracy here. It was an effort to safeguard this child and to see that she got appropriate therapy going forward, whatever that happened to be. Now, you'll hear that the admission diagnosis that was recognized at that time by Dr. Behar Posey and ultimately by Dr. Tepa Sanchez was CRPS, chronic regional pain syndrome. There were other suspicions, and you'll hear about those too. But for now, I want you to focus on what CRPS allegedly has as its features according to Dr. Kirkpatrick and what you've just heard from Mr. Anderson. It's lifelong. It's incurable. It can wax and wane. It can return at any time for any reason or no reason at all. It can cause a whole host of symptoms. And according to Dr. Kirkpatrick, who's the one who, who diagnosed it to begin with, it's incurable, it's always going to recur, and it always requires ketamine. Now, if there's any suggestion made that Dr. Kirkpatrick wanted to try alternative therapy first and had some regard for what the previous doctors had done, we're going to invite you to listen to the evidence about that and to look at the evidence about that and see how much was done, how much was actually attempted. The, uh, we believe the evidence is going to be that that wasn't something that was given a really fair, appropriate trial before ketamine was used. You're going to see, ultimately, Dr. Kirkpatrick, when this child was in the hospital in October and November of 2016, told Mrs. Kowalski that unless Maya Kowalski got more of his ketamine treatments, more of these high doses, that she would die a slow and painful death. Well, thankfully, he was wrong, or has been wrong so far. And we think he will continue to be wrong. At this point, it's well to walk the clock back a little bit. I want to ask you to look at the evidence <coughs> as, it, as you receive it on a comparative basis with these ideas in mind. You're going to hear, and you heard already, some recording from Dr. Kirkpatrick's first visit with Maya Kowalski and her family in uh, September, September 23rd to be exact, of 2015. I want to focus for a minute on her condition at that time, what the evidence will show that way. She was wheelchair bound. Her legs had atrophied. You saw the picture that Mr. Anderson showed you. Her legs and arms were hypersensitive to touch. She had limited use of most of, of her arms due to pain. You're going to see more of that. 
You're going to hear about pain in other parts of her body, alleged dystonia. She wasn't in school. She wasn't functional. She couldn't walk. She couldn't do her own ADLs. She had no normal function at that time. You're going to hear evidence that she came to that point from several, from several admissions, primarily for asthma at all children's, but they also concerned a number of admissions at other institutions. Now, Mr. Anderson has mentioned to you what the evidence is going to show about Lurie Children's Hospital, where she was taken by Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski, Tampa General Hospital, Sarasota Memorial Hospital. She had been seen as an outpatient by the first physicians group here in Sarasota, or the Sarasota Memorial Group. She had seen uh, some physicians from Lee County. There was over 40 specialists that she had seen before she found her way to Dr. Kirkpatrick's office. And all of those specialists, many of those specialists that weren't concerned primarily with asthma, felt that in her presentation, some of the work, work seen her for asthma, felt that in her presentation there was some psychogenic component of some sort. And there were words like conversion disorder, psychological component. There was even one at that early point who was concerned about Munchausen by proxy. What I'm suggesting to you is all children didn't blaze this trail, we just walked it. We found it on our own, but we walked it. So did these other folks, all 40 of them. And actually, the number is about 48. The point is, that was not an unreasonable thing for Johns Hopkins to ultimately come around to believing and come around to suspecting, because many others had suspected the same thing. The uh, recommendations for treatment of this disease, of the diseases that were suspected before Dr. Kirkpatrick, were physical therapy, psychological and cognitive behavioral therapy, sustained, long-term, intensive. That was back then. That's pretty much the therapy that Dr. Kirkpatrick rejected because he began the course of, of ketamine. When Dr. Kirkpatrick saw her on September 23rd, he didn't, you'll hear him say, I believe. He didn't care what the other doctors said. He didn't care what the records showed. He didn't review the records. He never contacted them. He never talked to them. There was no discussion in which he said, gee, I think it's this. I'm a specialist in this. You're a specialist in pediatrics. Let's reconcile our differences of opinion. Didn't do that. Instead, he diagnosed chronic regional pain syndrome. He's the first one to do it. And he began therapy, ketamine therapy. Now, you, you heard counsel talk about what the evidence is going to show Dr. Dr. Kirkpatrick did. Dr. Kirkpatrick is, will, will say in this courtroom or by deposition one that he began this child on a, on a four day treatment of high dose ketamine, what he considered to be high dose. You're going to hear incidentally that Dr. Hannah's high doses were multiple times what she was given by Dr. Kirkpatrick. He gave her four days, four consecutive days of ketamine and his records say that there was minimal effect. Minimal effect. He used opioids and narcotics to try to control her pain after those treatments. And we believe the evidence will show that as a result of those things, she wound up at All Children's Hospital with stomach pain and horrendous constipation. That was going to happen again and again, following large doses of ketamine and other drugs. She was being harmed by these things. But in September, and then in October, when Dr. Kirkpatrick treated her with high-dose ketamine, he prescribed more yet. And so she went to Mexico to see Dr. Cantu. 
Um, I'm glad to hear Dr. Cantu's going to be here. Because Dr. Cantu, in his deposition, described to us what his regimen of ketamine consisted of down in Monterey. It's a treatment that is not approved in this country. It, he developed it from a trial in Germany. He'll tell you that. It contemplates giving the patient seven to up to nine milligrams per kilogram per hour for several days and keeping them in a coma with intubation for that period of time. He's going to tell you that it's a risky procedure. He's going to tell you that he tells his patients that there is a 50% risk of death from that procedure. Now he's going to say he's never lost anybody, but listen to the cross-examination of Dr. Cantu about the dangers of that treatment, the degree of ketamine that was used, how it was used, and what his expectations of success were. Because those expectations were not realized. And that's a key fact here. Because what is going to happen here is that this child was given the same thing over and over and over and over again in increasing quantities, and it didn't work. And the first thing that didn't ultimately work was Dr. Cantu's treatment. She had to go back down to Mexico for a ketamine booster. Dr. Cantu will tell you that that's fairly usual, that, that happens, and that then he expects them to be pain-free for a number of weeks or months. Listen to what Dr. Cantu tells you about whether he knew anything about what happened after this. Because what happened after this was Maya Kowalski was taken back to this country. She was taken to see Dr. Hanna. And Dr. Hanna embarked on a course of ketamine treatment beginning in January of 2016 and extending to the door of all children on October 7, 2016. Nine months of therapy, 55 treatments, an average of one a week or more. 55 treatments of ketamine multiple, multiple times in excess, not just of what the doses uh, recommended by the manufacturers were, not just in excess of those, not just in excess of Johns Hopkins All Children's Policy, multiple times in excess of what Dr. Kirkpatrick gave, multiple times in excess of what Dr. Cantu gave. You may even hear Dr. Cantu admit that he wouldn't give those doses in the circumstances that Dr. Hanna did. You may hear him say that he, did, he never gave them, period. But all those doses of ketamine and all that therapy and all those drugs over that nine months, over that 13 months, we're going to ask you to look at the evidence and look at what the evidence shows about the result. The evidence shows that as of this, uh, October 7th, 2016, once again, Maya Kowalski is wheelchair bound. She's hypersensitive. She's unable to use her arms and legs. She's got chronic extreme complaints of pain. She's got leg atrophy and said to have dystonia. Okay. And in that year, incidentally, she gained four pounds. Think about that. You're going to hear more about that. Because Dr. Hanna will tell you that he recognized that his patient was malnourished. Over that period of time, over a year, she gained four pounds. Now, she also, at All Children's, was on 21 different medications as of October 7, 2016. 21 different medications. 
Let's compare for a moment what the evidence shows regarding Maya Kowalski's condition at the time of her first appointment with Dr. Kirkpatrick and the time she's admitted to all children's a year later. You can see the slide. The evidence will show that she was in essentially the same condition with one addition. In addition to the problem she was having when she saw Dr. Kirkpatrick back in September 2015, in addition, she was malnourished. You'll also hear evidence that during that same period of time, there were three occasions, October 7th was the fourth, when she was in the emergency room complaining of extreme stomach pain following doses, high doses of ketamine and other drugs. We suggest to you the evidence will show that she was being harmed by these large doses of medication. The evidence will show you that the doctor's concern about how much she was being given and the frequency with which she was being given it was very well placed and is vindicated by what happened later. Let's take that comparison one step further. We believe the evidence is going to show you that between the time that Maya Kowalski was seen on October 7th in the, in the ACH emergency room and the time she was discharged three months later, she had gained four and a half pounds, which is more than she had gained a net weight gain in the last year before admission. She was still in a wheelchair, but she wasn't complaining of extreme pain constantly. She was comfortable. She was using her arms. And we believe she was improved. There will be evidence you hear from the witness stand about her condition at the time of discharge versus her condition at the time of admission. But perhaps more telling is the condition under which she was discharged. At that time, She went from 21 medications down to three. And at that time, she began a course of physical therapy and counseling that, by the following school year, had her back in school. That was pretty much the regimen that was recommended for her at all children's. That was pretty much the regimen that could have been given her earlier and sustained and perhaps saved her a lot of anguish and pain and perhaps this loss. Um, she got her physical therapy. She got counseling. Pain medications were withdrawn. You may very well hear that to this day she's on no pain medication. Now you heard it suggested by counsel that she couldn't take ketamine. Indeed, when she was discharged, the court, this court, the court of this circuit, not this judge. Jackson. What basis? What's the legal basis? <coughs> Motion to eliminate. I don't recall that one. You can continue. Directed her discharge. She could not be discharged without, without an order of the court. And she was discharged with instructions as to what medication she could have at that time. She could not have ketamine. She could not have anal heavy analgesics without the court's intervention. That matter was dismissed several months later after she did well in her father's custody. And she's free to get whatever she wants today. But for the present, let me just mention this. I'll deal more with it. You're going to hear a lot more about it. Once the court entered an order following a report of child abuse that she was to be sheltered at all children's under the custody of the Department of Children and Families. All Children's Hospital did not have the ability to discharge her without court approval, even if it wanted to. You're going to hear evidence. You can hear evidence from DCF personnel who will tell you 
we're the ones that set the visitation parameters. We're the ones that decreed who she could see, when she could see them, what she could have, what she could have in her room, what she would have access to. The hospital, unfortunately, was put in the position of having to implement those orders. That's what we tried to do. But throughout this case, we're going to ask you to try to avoid conflating what was done by the court or ordered by the court with what was done by the hospital. Because the hospital is not the court. The hospital is not DCF. The hospital has to follow that. And the hospital doesn't institute that. The court and DCF do. Now, I digressed a little bit there, but I want you to look, I want you to pay attention, I'm sure you will, to what the evidence will show regarding Maya Kowalski's condition today. If she's not at the head of her class at Venice High School, she's real close. She served in her student government. She works out. She's on track to get a high school diploma and an AA degree on time. She's dating. She's functional. She walks unassisted. She's not taking pain medication. To, 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 to some apparent, she's doing very well and we hope it stays that way. Now let's walk back the clock once again to uh, October 7th. 2017. At that time, we described what kind, somewhat, what happened in the emergency room. You're going to hear more about that from uh, nurse witnesses. Doc, uh, Maya Kowalski was admitted to the PICU. We talked about that. Dr. Beatrice Tepa Sanchez was the one on duty that night. You'll see what her credentials were. We'll tell you what her what her credentials are and her board certification in pediatrics and intensive medicine. She will tell you that what she did was attempt to understand what was going on with this child. And you'll see her, and you'll hear her walk through her admission history and physical, and the research that she did into the records that were available to her at all children's of previous encounters. You'll see her discharge summary, and you'll see the care that she took to track down what this patient's history was. And you'll see that when she did that and she was able to get the child admitted and, st and, and sedated and started stabilizing, that she did call appropriate consultations. She did get pain management and anesthesiology involved. She did call psychiatry. And because of her concern, you'll hear that she also called a pediatric child abuse expert. Dr. Sally Smith. Doctor, you'll hear Dr. Smith is the head, the medical director of the child protection team, the CPT, for DCF, the Division of Family Services, or excuse me, the Division of uh, Department of Children and Families. I just gave away my age, by the way. <coughs> they used to call it the 70s. But in any event, you'll hear that she contacted Dr. Smith to say, basically, I'm not sure what's going on here. Can you check this out? And you'll hear that Dr. Smith did. You'll hear that Dr. Smith was not an employee of All Children's Hospital, that she was not part of the treatment team, but she was there as a resource. And you'll see over time, and we'll talk about this again in a minute, the investigation that she conducted in connection with her duties with DCF and the child protection team. She was not an employee of all children's and never held herself out as such. And you may hear from Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski themselves that they knew that from, the, from day one. Now, I mentioned that uh, Dr. Tepa Sanchez got her colleagues involved. One of those colleagues you'll hear from is Dr. Richard Elliott. Dr. Elliott is a uh, board certified anesthesiology uh, in pediatrics. Uh, he will be here and testify about what he, he found, what his interactions with Ms. Kowalski were, and how 
he believed this child needed to be weaned off of high dose medication and weaned off of the regimen that she had been on. Uh, you'll also hear from Dr. Jenny Dolan. She's in the same discipline. She too had interactions. And you'll hear from both those doctors that during the time they were caring for this patient, they were having a problem with what Mrs. Kowalski wanted. Mrs. Kowalski wanted an intrathecal pain pump placed in her daughter's spine to deliver a medication called clonidine, a powerful drug, into her spine, spinal canal. She was told that was a bad idea by the doctors at All Children's. She was told the same thing by doctors at Nemours. Indeed, you're going to hear Dr. Kirkpatrick tell her that's a bad idea. She was insistent upon asking for that over and over. She was talking about taking her daughter back to Mexico and Italy for more high-dose ketamine that she had just come off of and that the doctors at All Children's felt weren't working and frankly we would suggest to you the evidence suggests weren't working. The plan of care that the doctors wanted to pursue was consultation, weaning of the medications, appropriate care, and ultimately transfer. Now I'm going to go past the slide on Dr. Smith here and, and, and go fast forward here because I want to talk about several specific allegations that have to do with the sequence of events from this point forward in the case and what the evidence is going to show you about that sequence of events. This child was admitted with a consent form agreeing to treatment signed off by Mr. Kowalski on October 7th of 2016. By that Monday, by that Sunday, the family, particularly Mrs. Kowalski, wanted to leave. They were being dissuaded from that. They'll tell you that on the morning of October 10th or 11th, that they were told they couldn't leave. I'm going to invite you to listen to what the evidence will show about that encounter. Because we believe the evidence will show, and you'll hear Mr. Kowalski say that no one ever told him he could not leave at All Children's Hospital. We believe the evidence will also show that at that time, with the threats being made by the mother to find more high-dose dangerous ketamine, that it was reasonable and warranted for the doctors to decline that if they had chosen to do so. We don't believe they did. We think that the evidence is more persuasive and shows you that there was a convocation of folks on the morning of October 10th or 11th at which there was a discussion of the plan, there was a discussion of the weaning, there was a discussion of stabilization, the plan being let's get her weaned off this medication safely and then let's transfer her to an institution where more intensive physical therapy, more intensive behavioral therapy and more intensive occupational therapy is available. The evidence will show you that All Children's Hospital was not trying to, to imprison this young lady. We were trying to get her stabilized and transfer to somewhere where she could get the help that she needed. And you're going to see that that somewhere was identified by Dr. Michelle Smith and others as Nemours Children's Hospital brief look at Dr. Smith's qualifications. You're going to hear from her from the witness stand. Dr. Smith is presently our chief of staff. She's also a board certified pediatrician and intensivist. She came into this case on October 9th and she virtually from the outset began discussing with Mrs. Kowalski transfer of the patient. Now there's her plan of care. That's what she wanted to pursue. And she tried to get it done with 
a transfer from PICU to PICU to Nemours. She felt at the time that if she transferred the child to Nemours, the intensive pain management program could begin while the child was still the, an inpatient. Nemours declined the transfer. She didn't stop though. So I'm going to skip past this slide because we pretty much covered it. She didn't stop. After that discussion at which the family agreed to stay, and you're going to see multiple sources of documentation of that, after that discussion, she took it upon herself to call the Moors again. And she called a doctor named Lizgelia Santana Rojas. You're going to hear that Dr. Santana Rojas, and you're going to hear from her, we believe, by Zoom. You're going to hear Dr. Santana Rojas verify what she was told, or what she told Mrs. Kowalski, and what Dr. Smith will say she told Mrs. Kowalski. And that's basically this. She said that Nemours wouldn't take a transfer for inpatient, but that Dr. Santana Rojas operated an outpatient pain management clinic, specializing in pediatrics because that's all Nemours does, just like all children. All we treat is pediatrics, all they treat is pediatrics. In their pain management program, they treat CRPS. You'll hear Dr. Santana Rojas describe that she told Mrs. Kowalski that. You'll hear her say that she was asked by Mrs. Kowalski, if I go over there, if I come to your program, will you put in an intrathecal pain pump? And Dr. Santana Rojas said, no, we won't do that. That's not part of our program. That's dangerous. It's against your, your daughter's interest. But what we will do, without ketamine, without analgesic, what we will do is give her intensive physical, occupational, and behavioral therapy, and I'm going to replicate with her the program I trained in at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. I've replicated that program here and we're getting very good results. If you bring your daughter over here as an outpatient, we'll put her in our program. You hear Dr. Smith pretty much tell you the same thing. I'm not sure what Dr. Santana Rojas is going to say about this, but I know what Dr. Smith's going to say. And it's this. Dr. Smith left the hospital that day thinking she had a deal. She thought, okay, we're going to get this child weaned and stable, and then we're going to transfer her as an outpatient in her family's custody to Nemours, pain management. Now, as you hear the evidence come in, you are going to see at this, at this point, on October 11, 2016, there had been a report accepted to DCF. There had been an investigation started, but nothing really had taken place. There had not been a dependency petition filed. There had been no court order. The court hadn't denied the Kowalski's access to their daughters. They hadn't done anything. At this point, on October 11th, All Children's <coughs> Hospital and its staff were attempting to facilitate Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski taking their daughter out of All Children's Hospital in their custody and taking her as an outpatient for treatment at the morning. We suggest to you that if that had happened, we would not be together today. We su we're going to suggest to you that the evidence will show that if that had happened, it's reasonable to think that none of this would have occurred. 
We believe that had that occurred, this entire matter could have been sidetracked and never, and never brought us together. But that's not what happened. Because the next morning, when Dr. Smith arrived back at the hospital, she found that Mrs. Kowalski wanted to take Maya Kowalski to Dr. Hannah for more ketamine, that she wanted to seek an intrathecal pain catheter elsewhere, that she wanted to obtain more ketamine elsewhere, and that there was still discussion of Mexico or Italy. Shortly after that, there was a shelter order. At that point, the circumstances under which Maya was a patient at all children's were not dictated by the hospital, they were dictated by the court and DCF. Now, the situation proceeded with the weaning completed at all children's. All children's, the evidence will show, attempted to get this child the physical therapy on an inpatient basis that it could provide. We didn't think it was enough, but we did what we could. She got some behavioral therapy, although not the kind that she needed. We didn't have it available. That's why we wanted to transfer her. But you'll see as you go forward and you hear witness after witness and you look in the hospital chart, you're going to see that over and over and over again, we weren't warehousing this child voluntarily. You'll see it noted over and over. Medically cleared for discharge awaiting court disposition. At the close of all the evidence, we'll tote up for you the number of times that appears in the record. But we're going to suggest to you the evidence is going to be conclusive that there was never any false imprisonment of this child's all children's hospital. Now, I want to talk before I get into disease versus syndrome and problems with diagnosis. I want to talk about a couple other things. One is the matter of, of a battery and surveillance. We believe the evidence is going to show you that whenever there was a touching of Maya Kowalski, it was done for therapeutic or clinical reasons or to comfort a child. There was never any intent to do her any harm. There was never any intent to be offensive or harmful. And we believe that at the end of all the evidence you're going to find that there was never any point at which a reasonable person would have taken offense at how she was touched and how her care was managed in that regard. Um, we need to talk a minute about the problems with diagnosis here. Um, you're going to hear a lot about CRPS, conversion disorder, and a number of other things. CRPS and conversion disorder and these mental diagnoses have, have a couple of things that are significant about it. One is that they aren't diseases in the sense that doctors use that term concretely. A disease is something that you can see and you can diagnose and there isn't any question about it. Appendicitis, most forms of cancer. There's the lab test that proves it or disproves it. If you have HIV, there's a lab test for it. If you have appendicitis, there's an imaging study that shows a hot appendix. Objective, syndromes aren't like that. In a syndrome, you piece together a constellation of symptoms and a constellation of findings, and it's much more subjective. And that's why we have things like the Budapest criteria that council talked about, and you're going to hear a lot about that going forward. In this particular case, you're going to hear that there was a good deal of controversy about what this diagnosis was. When this patient came in to, to all children, we did in fact admit her with a diagnosis of CRPS. And we continued to bill for that and to, to treat that, and we tried to transfer her with that diagnosis. 
But as time went on, for the same reason that CRPS was not suspected at Tampa General or at Lurie's or elsewhere, we questioned the diagnosis. And while the diagnosis was carried forward as a rule out, it was not the, the discharge diagnosis, although we noted in the discharge summary that it was never ruled out. Now, the, uh, you're going to hear much about CRPS, but I'm going to skip past this slide because we kind of covered this. You are going to hear a lot about CRPS's rarity, and you're going to hear a lot of reasons given why we didn't believe this is CRPS. One reason was that it was presenting as a general pain syndrome involving the entire body. Well, what's the name of the, the name of the syndrome? Chronic regional pain syndrome. Doesn't usually present as whole body. You're going to hear that's vanishingly rare, if not almost unheard of. You're also going to hear that there are various presentation factors about this disease that were never really observed on a consistent basis. Like decrease of hair loss, nail, nail changes, skin asymmetric tissue sh uh, changes in the skin. A lot of these observations about CRPS just weren't consistently present. There were, however, re reasons to suspect conversion disorder. Now, now we've arrived at psychiatric or psychological issues. There's a lot of misconceptions about psychology and psychiatry and mental illness. And people act like saying it's conversion disorder or it's all in your head is some kind of epitaph. It's an insult. That's not the case. When these doctors were writing down conversion disorder, they weren't trying to insult somebody. They were trying to attach a suspicion and a diagnosis to get a patient the help they needed. No one's telling this patient she doesn't have pain. What they're saying is, that what their question is, what's causing it? And what you do about it? And that's the central issue here in many respects because this entire case revolves around not so much what the diagnosis is, but what the clinical treatment is. And I've got a slide here in a minute that will show you that, show you this, that I'll probably skip when we get to it because now I'm taking it out of order because as usual in an opening statement, I'm way off the reservation from what I'm supposed to be doing in, in order. But since it, uh, it's appropriate, I'll, I'll say it here. When you look and when you hear what the evidence is about the reasonable standard of care treatment for CRPS, for conversion disorder, for a pain syndrome manifesting by Mun as Munchausen by proxy, for factitious disorder manifesting as a pain syndrome, when you hear what the treatment is, the clinical treatment is for all those things, the same thing. Maybe the mix differs, but it's basically physical therapy, occupational therapy, and psychological or cognitive behavioral therapy. Those are the treatments. And you're going to hear from experts who treat this this disease day in, day out, and these diseases, I should say, all of them, day in, day out, and they do it without putting the patient in a coma, without giving the patient 15, 20 times the, the, the recommended dose of ketamine over months and months and months. They do it by therapy, and the results they get are stellar. And you'll hear that from them. You're, you'll also hear that for that same set of reasons, this business about billing just isn't supported by the evidence. You're going to see the billing records. You're going to see the billing sheets. You're going to see that CRPS was an item. It was one of a number of items 
that was being billed for. You're going to hear that there was no change in the medical reimbursement for the billing as a result of where, in what place, whether it's one or 12, and that's literally how many diagnoses there were that points in this, whether it was the first diagnosis or the sixth or the eighth or the tenth, you're gonna hear that the billing reimbursement never changed. And the reason for that was that while you needed a diagnosis to put on that code, what was really being billed for was the services rendered. And you'll see the billing sheets and the services that are laid out item by item, and you'll see that those didn't change either. You'll also hear that none of this cost Mr. Kowalski a dime. And you'll also hear that the insurer who was billed for the services rendered by All Children's Hospital for three months of inpatient therapy, the insurer never complained, didn't say a word. Approved the care, approved the billing, no problem. Now, you're going to hear a lot about Munchausen by proxy, and I'm going to kind of fast forward through this for one reason, that, that we're running a little bit low on time, but the other reason is that it's a very technical thing, and it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't merit near the attention that it's gotten because it's been a flashpoint throughout this. There was a suspicion of Munchausen by proxy. It wasn't just all children's suspicion. There was a concern that part of this child's condition was being fostered or encouraged by the mother. There was a concern that the mother was seeking out care that was too aggressive, that was dangerous, and would persist in doing so if she were permitted to do so. That's what got this ball rolling. And I told you a few minutes ago what the evidence will show about the attempt to transfer for outpatient care, why it failed, and why as a result of that these investigations rolled forward. The, this is a slide I told you I'm going to, I'm going to skip because this talks about what the, what the therapy is and how it is all of them. We talked about billing fraud, so I'm going to skip over this slide as well. Let me talk about photographs for a minute. You've heard about the photos that were taken. These photos were taken for clinical reasons. We believe the evidence will show you that they were taken pursuant to the consent that Mr. Kowalski signed when he, had, he was admitted, and which he will, he will, I believe, admit to you he never rescinded. The purpose of the, of the photos was to document the condition of the child. If there were skin lesions, even if they were not being documented in the, in the nursing notes, they needed to be documented, they needed to be observed if they got worse. If there were new ones being developing we need to know that too but the point is that they were they were being taken to assist in diagnosis and follow the follow the child's condition you heard about surveillance the movie surveillance video you're going to hear that, that wasn't a new idea either that also happened at Tampa Channel why was it done because Medical professionals wanted to know what the child's capabilities were. Now, that video is going to tell you a couple, you're going to see, we're not going to ask you to watch 42 hours of video. But you're going to see grabs from that video that show several things from our standpoint. You're going to hear some of the plaintiff walks. From our standpoint, you're going to see in that video that Maya Kowalski who's saying her legs are hypersensitive and can't be touched, saying she can't move her legs, is moving her legs in bed, moving her legs into a position that we used to call Indian style, and now we call crisscross applesauce. She was able to assume that position and hold that position voluntarily and without a problem. You're also going to see and get some idea of the fact 
that she was not in that room for 42 hours. You'll see it, that she's in and out. She went to therapy, she went to other places. And you'll see the nurses coming and going and assisting her when indicated to the commode. The commode wasn't placed out of her reach for any kind of malicious purpose. It was placed in the position that it was because she had nursing staff available to help her, as you'll see they did, and because if you put it too close or in too, too close position to the bedside, it would obstruct the nurse's ability to get to the bed. It was strictly a matter of happenstance. It was not a matter of intent. And that brings me to another point, and it's on this slide. You're not going to hear any evidence that the 50-some-odd medical, medical doctors and professionals who took care of Maya Kowalski over three months somehow banded together in some sort of cabal and hatched a plot or a conspiracy to do harm. You're just not going to hear that. You're instead going to hear from a constellation of dedicated pediatricians and dedicated specialists who were genuinely trying to do the right thing for this patient. They may have differed in, in some opinions with the family, but their uppermost objective was to keep this child safe and to get this child the therapy and the treatment that she needed. Now, why was the diagnosis an issue if the treatment was the same? That's a reasonable question. Let me suggest that the evidence is and will be that the importance of the diagnosis is the result of the fact that that, that CRPS diagnosis was being used to justify dangerous care, dangerous levels of ketamine, levels of ketamine and other drugs that aren't even recognized in the literature. Those doctors weren't going to come get the patient. The family was going to take the patient to those doctors. And so it was important to get the diagnosis straight and the treatment straight so that the right mix of therapy could be formulated and the, the best job could be done to get Maya Kowalski into a position of being comfortable, functional, and lead a happy and healthy life. That's what we were attempting to do. There's never an intent, an intent to do anything but that. Um, over the next few weeks, we think you're going to hear a number of experts in the courtroom. We'll be bringing in experts from California and elsewhere. They're going to talk to you about whether or not the overarching allegation against all children's and its physicians, including even Sally Smith, that they were negligent in Maya Kowalski's care and that their negligence somehow caused injury. We're going to suggest to you that, first of all, there was no ultimate injury caused given the condition that she was given to us in. But more importantly, there was no deviation from the standard of care. You're going to hear from different doctors in different specialties that the care that was taken in diagnosing and treating Maya Kowalski, you're going to hear about teams of consultants, you're going to hear about meticulous investigations. You can see that Sally Smith formulated a 45-page single-space report of her review of literally thousands of medical records to come up with her diagnosis, you're going to see a lot of effort and care and expertise went in to the effort made to treat this child at, at, at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. We believe that the evidence will be unequivocal that that degree of effort, insight, investigation, and monitoring and care 
comported in every respect with what is reasonable and what is recognized as being reasonable and appropriate by other similar physicians. And we don't believe you're going to hear any credible evidence otherwise. You heard the judge give you a, a, a definition of medical negligence. I just kind of paraphrased it. But the point I'm making to you is that the evidence will ultimately show that these doctors and these nurses and this hospital staff acted reasonably and prudently to treat a difficult and challenging case they were presented with and they did it consistently over three months. They don't have to be right under the law. All they have to be is reasonable. And we will suggest to you that the evidence will show that first, they probably were right, but even if they weren't, they were more than reasonable. At the end of all this, at the end of all the evidence, I'll have another chance to visit with you or my colleague, Mr. Shapiro, will. Uh, you're going to hear a lot between now and then. And again, I appreciate very much your, your uh, attentiveness and your diligence, as does my client and people at uh, All Children's Hospital. I thank you for your attention and look forward to working with you in the next few weeks. And you'll be pleased to know I skipped at least three slides. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.